Hello, this is George Whitman speaking. You are listening to the Shakespeare and Company broadcast. Okay, um, we're going to kick off. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, well, you wait uh, 64 years for a world-renowned mathematician to visit Shakespeare and Company, and then two come along at once. Um, Michael Harris is Professor of Mathematics at the University Paris Diderot and Columbia University. He is the author or co-author of more than 70 mathematical books and articles, and has received a number of prizes, including the Clay Research Award, which he shared in 2007 with Richard Taylor. In Mathematics Without Apologies, Michael asks what pure mathematicians do and why they do it. Looking beyond the conventional answers for the sake of truth, beauty and practical applications, this book offers an eclectic panorama of the lives, values, hopes and fears of mathematicians in the 21st century, touching on a wide variety of questions such as, are mathematicians to blame for the 2008 financial crisis? How can we talk about the ideas we were born too soon to understand? And how should you react if you're asked to explain number theory at a dinner party? Cédric Viani is a French mathematician who has received many international awards for his work, including the Jacques Herbrand Prize, the Prize for European, of the European Mathematical Society, the Fermat Prize, and the Henri Poincaré Prize. In 2010, he was awarded the Fields Medal for his work on Landau Damping and the Boltzmann Equation. He is a professor at Lyon University and director of the Institut Henri Poincaré in Paris, working primarily on partial differential equations and mathematical physics. In Birth of a Theorem, Cedric takes us on a mesmerizing journey as he wrestles with a new theorem that will win him, win him the most coveted prize in mathematics. Along the way, the encounter, he encounters obstacles and setbacks, losses of faith and even brushes with madness. It is a gripping story of courage and partnership, doubt and anxiety, elation and despair. Please join me in welcoming Michael Harris and Cedric Viani. Okay, uh, before we kick off with a couple of readings, I just wanted to just get a sort of a feeling for the audience here. Um, okay, do we have any mathematicians in the audience? Just raise your hand if you... Okay, a few down here, one sort of hiding behind the Okay, do we have any mathematics students, university level, things like that? Okay, a few uh, high school mathematics level people who think people who think general calculus was a Roman warrior rather than <laughs> okay good just uh, okay so I think so it's very much a, a general audience we have here tonight so we're going to have a uh, a reading from Cedric a reading from Michael I'm going to ask a few questions and then we're going to open it out to the audience. So if you have any questions um, that come to mind during the event, uh, keep them in mind and we'll pass the microphone round after. So um, to kick off the evening, please welcome Cedric Viani. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here in this uh, very uh, emblematic place. So uh, let me uh, first uh, start with a few minutes of presentation of the work, its genesis and uh, the result, and then I will read uh, one extract, which I consider as uh, very uh, characteristic of the work. So let's uh, go back to some time in... Uh, 2010, early 2010, where I was um, a guest of uh, dinner at Fondation Cartier for Contemporary Art. This was uh, before I received uh, the uh, big awards that put me in the newspaper. So at this time, I was not particularly well known, but uh, I had been working with the Cartier Foundation and uh, we were preparing this exhibition, which I did later on uh, mathematics, a beautiful elsewhere. And so uh, there I was in this uh, dinner, which was organized in the honor of Takeshi Kitano, you know, the famous uh, Japanese filmmaker. On this occasion, I uh, learned that he was an avid uh, mathematics lover. And uh, I was uh, discussing uh, there with my neighbors at the table. And nearby table, there was a guy who was obviously bored, but uh, obviously also intrigued by uh, me just for... I want to say dressing uh, kind of uh, uh, habits and uh, wondering what I was doing, etc. And uh, at the end of the 
dinner, he comes at my table and says, hey, I heard that you are a mathematician interested in uh, communication and so on. I am the director of the Grasset Editions. I would love to have a book written by a mathematician. Why don't you come by my office to discuss it? The strange thing is that I did come to his office to discuss it, even though uh, Grasset is well known as, uh, uh, I know, for... Uh, to say novels and so on, but not for uh, writing science. I had in mind a couple of possible science projects, like why don't I write a book on entropy? You know, I'm considered as one of the experts. I could write this beautiful book for readers. He did not care at all. I had I gave him another suggestion, this book, but he had no interest whatsoever. What he told me is, all I want to know is what you do in your life. What is it? How is it to be a mathematician in your daily life? What do you think? What is there? And so on. I came out of his office quite... You know, embarrassed. How am I going to answer the need of this guy? And then I thought, you know, we spend part of our time talking with uh, people outside the field saying research is an adventure. So let's take this as a challenge. Talk, talk, tell, tell, tell the research as an adventure. And it could be like, uh, like uh, it, we are uh, trying to fight to get some result and so on. But uh, there should be a particular goal, a particular thing that we are realizing. And so I will center it on one theorem because that is our goal when we are embarked on some journey as mathematicians. Prove a new theorem. Theorem is this combination of uh, statements and uh, propositions which in the end gets you to a new mathematical truth and has to be proved by logic. It is said that uh, each year more than 100,000 new theorems are proved. Not all of them are of equal importance and not uh, all of them are correct when they are proven. Very often there are mistakes and so on, but any of them is a little bit or a big adventure. Some of them make headlines, when, as was the case when the Poincaré conjecture was proven by Grigory Perelman. It was everywhere in the news a solution of a famous open problem which had been uh, changing mathematicians for more than 100 years. Other ones are quite more routine and just improvements of uh, results already known. And uh, uh, other ones, you read them and you think you should directly go to the garbage. And the other ones, you are impressed. There's all kinds of possible combinations. But I wanted to depict real life. I picked up a theorem of mine which had been a lot of uh, trouble, a lot of difficulties, and which I knew would allow me to describe every feature of the life of the mathematician, or almost every. So at the time, I had uh, just uh, completed a big work on the uh, uh, problem of plasma physics, considered from the mathematical point of view. In technical terms, this is called Landau damping. And I thought, OK, I will tell this story, but not explaining about plasma physics, not explaining about the meaning of the theorem, just explaining about the adventures, the circumstances. And then I, I started writing it like this chapter after this situation, then progress, then regress, then mistake, then correct the mistake, then discussion, so that all the things which are familiar to us in the research life would be present. When you discuss with somebody and you have the new idea of a new problem to work on, when you are stuck and you don't know what to do, when you discover there is a big mistake in the argument that you are very proud of, when you are searching for the right theorem to prove, what do I want to do? That's the first question you have to uh, answer in research, and that's a big step. Uh, when you are finding a new paper that will uh, lead you towards the solution, when you are presenting the result to your fellow colleagues and they are telling you this is wrong, etc. When you discover there is a big mistake in the proof that you just exposed uh, uh, yesterday to your colleagues, and so on and so forth. All the messy, complicated, and chaotic process which uh, researchers are very familiar with, but which uh, people outside have usually no idea, because what is shown outside is just the final result. Let me show you a beautiful theorem. Let me explain you. It is very simple. When somebody tells you this, you can be sure, in fact, it has uh, required years of hard work for people to understand what it is about, and it was so complicated. Before looking simple, things always are complicated and messy. And so that was the, that was the idea. Also, the, so I uh, wrote it uh, with uh, several principles. One would be that it would be as faithful as possible, just the truth, nothing but the truth, all the truth. And this meant in particular explaining 
how we speak, showing excerpts of our language, emails, because these are so important to make our work advance, showing also the equations, because in the end, our job is to give back, uh, give an article which is full of equations and mathematical reasoning and has to be understood by specialists, and uh, be totally faithful. By the way, this is the first broad audience book that I'm aware of, which is written in tech, the uh, software that all mathematicians use to write their uh, formulas and uh, mathematical articles. And uh, also, uh, another principle I uh, wanted would be to give all the ingredients. Uh, when you are doing research, you know that such an important role is placed by the source of documentation that you have, what gives you the ideas. Also, such an important role is played by your motivation, the fact that you go on and you believe you will do it, even if everything seems to be showing you that you will not do it. Uh, you know how important are the exchanges, and so there are these emails and so on. You know uh, also how important is the environment. Environment means a laboratory, and uh, the uh, book is in various environments. It starts in Lyon, and it's important that it starts in my laboratory in Ecole Normale Supérieure of Lyon. It continues in Princeton, and it's a fully different atmosphere. And when you read the book, I hope you understand why the fact that this different atmosphere matters at this point of the quest. And also showing uh, what you do to help the mathematical thinking. Sometimes walking and thinking, sometimes listening to music, or working at uh, 3 a.m. in the morning, trying to figure out how you will manage to solve the difficulty, and so on and so forth. And also the most beautiful moments for mathematicians, when the illumination arises, you don't know where it, where it is from, but it, is, uh, it is comes to you. The, when this is one of the dramatic points in the tale actually at some point I am like going uh, to bed at maybe 3 a.m., 4 a.m. after working for hours and hours trying to fix a proof which doesn't work even though I foolishly announced a few days ago that I knew how to do it in public and uh, you know huge pressure going to bed like despair like it will not work and getting up and like with a voice in my head saying take free transform of the second term put it on the other side and this was the start of the solution showing that even in the most desperate moments when we are exhausted and so on your brain is still continuing to work for you even when you think you are just resting and sleeping this all these environments and these things that you are using to prove the theorem which means collaborators which means means the uh, environment, which is the illumination, the unconscious part of your brain. All this plays a super important role, but you never usually talk about it when you're presenting mathematical research. And so uh, this, was, uh, this was there. Mathematics is at the same time uh, science, an art, and a social activity. All mathematicians know this. And usually when you discuss it, you simplify the science a little bit of the social part, uh, and a little bit of the art, and here it was kind of the reverse. Almost no science, all about the social activity and a little bit about the art. It was also a way to pay tribute. You know, when you receive awards, you are always embarrassed because you know how much work of your collaborators has been put in your discoveries. But the collaborators sometimes don't receive the awards. You receive it only and you always say, I thank my collaborators and so on. It's sincere usually. We all know uh, in research how much we owe to our collaborators. But this was even more. Reading it and showing the over hundreds of pages how much this was a teamwork rather than the work of an individual. So this was the, these were the principles. I put it in a rather strange form, putting like extracts of like tail, like uh, some bits of uh, cultural parts, some bits of uh, emails, some poetry, some songs, whatever, all kinds of things, all kinds of things. And then uh, I sent it to the uh, editor, thinking, what the hell will he think of this? Maybe he will say, you're so crazy, I never want to hear about you again. And after a couple of weeks, he told me, your book is amazing. And this was a extremely strong moment when I received this, uh, this answer. I had shown the manuscript only to my wife and my main collaborator and receiving the, the first feedback like this was amazing. Uh, one issue that I will just, two things that I will just comment. And the global image that is there is that of a growing kind of living being. The theorem in itself is the living being. You see it at the first stage 
there is a conversation between two mathematicians and they think, oh, why don't we work on this? It's like a seed, you know, it's like fecundation. Final stage is when the paper is ready for publication. One would think, okay, this is the end. This is not really the end, it's the birth. It's the end of the maturating uh, process. After the theorem is published, there will be a life afterwards. It will be used, it will inspire people, it will be simplified, it will live with the other theorems. But all the process behind is like the pregnancy. And first chapter is fecundation, last chapter is the birth. So that's the, that's the idea. Second command is I put the formulas rho. I want it to be there. Also, they give an impression of what we are doing, and also they show you what is the current stage of this living being which is being made. And uh, you can see, even if you understand nothing to mathematics, that it's different stage on first chapter and on last chapter, and you see intermediate stages. Of course, they are not there for understanding. And by the way, often people who have trouble reading it are people who know about mathematics because they try to understand. They should not. It's not there for understanding. It's there for illustration. And the uh, final comment is about the title. So when I uh, did the English, the French version, I sent it and I said, uh, I suggested the title, Naissance d'un théorème which is birth of a theorem. But then the French editor says, you know, naissance d'un théorème, it's a bit too explicit. Why don't you look for something more romantic, more ambiguous? I didn't know. And then I, I came up after a few trials with théorème vivant. Théorème vivant is more ambiguous, living theorem. You don't know what it is about. Maybe it's because the people are living. Maybe the author is a living theorem. Who knows what it means? Maybe it's because it's a, a growing process. It reminded me of a book I was reading as a child called Désert Vivant, Desert Lives. It was a book full of photographs, Disney book for kids, and uh, all about the desert. Desert, we think of it as this dry, boring place, completely dead. But when you know where to look, it's full of life and color. And that's what you learn in this book, which I had as a child. Mathematics is the same. Most people outside the field think it's dead and boring and already known. And people in it know when you know how to do it, it's full of life and color. And so the analogy for me was uh, very good. But then it came to the English editors. And they said, OK. You know, Théorème vivant, living theory, it's a bit too ambiguous. Why don't we look for something more explicit? Uh, here is this idea, birth of the theorem. What do you think about it? I said, yes, okay, good. <laughs> Let's do it. And I thought it was fun. So that's the, that's the story of the, of the title. Uh, I, let me read an excerpt maybe what about time. How, how well is it? Okay. So here is, this is in Princeton, April 1st. 2009. By the way, all the chronology, most of it was reconstructed from emails. It's crazy the amount of information that there is in our email since we are writing so much and so much. Sometimes you email through collaborators, emails to your friends and so on. So April 1st, 2009, Princeton. First day of April, the day of fishes and fools. This afternoon, watched an episode of Lady Oscar with Claire and the children. Marie Antoinette. Axel de Fersen and Oscar de Jarget, spinning round in a whirl of fine phrases and noble sentiments amid the lengthening shadows of the French Revolution. And this evening, before going to sleep, we watched a YouTube video of Gribouille singing Le Marin et la Rose. Simply marvelous. There's some great stuff on the internet. During the past week, I've learned so much from lecturing on Landau Damping. After my first talk, once his irritation had subsided, Elliot shared some valuable insights into the conceptual difficulties of the periodic Coulomb model. At the second talk, I laid out the main physical idea of the proof. Elliot very much appreciated the mixture of mathematics and physics. He seemed not only engaged, but genuinely supportive. By the time of the third talk, I'd come up with an answer to Hamet's objection, and I was able to formulate almost optimal assumptions regarding the stability condition and perturbation length, 
I had taken a risk, presenting completely new results that were still only half-baked, but the gamble paid off. Their criticisms enabled me to make much faster progress than I could have otherwise. Once again, I had to put myself in a vulnerable position in order to become stronger. And the connection with KAM finally became clear to me. The ability to detect hidden connections between different areas of mathematics is what has made my reputation. These connections are invaluable. It's a bit like a game of ping pong. Every discovery you make on one side helps you discover something new on the other. The connections make it possible to see more of the landscape on both sides. My first important result with the Italian mathematician Giuseppe Toscani came in 1997. When I was 24 years old, the unsuspected link between Boltzmann entropy production, the Fokker-Planck equation, and entropy production for plasmas. The next one came 18 months later with my German collaborator Felix Otto. The hidden link between the solar logarithmic sublife inequality and Talagans concentration inequality. Two other proofs have been proposed in the years since. This is how I got started exploring the field of optimal transport. Thanks to our paper, I was invited to give a graduate level course at Georgia Tech, which in turn gave birth to my first book. During my thesis defense in 1998, Yves Meyer marveled at the miraculous relation I had brought to light. 20 years ago, people would have laughed at your work. No one believed in miracles then. Hey, but I believe in miracles, and I shall uncover more of them. In my thesis, I recognized four spiritual fathers. My thesis director, Pierre Rillions, my tutor, Yann Brunier, and Eric Carlen and Michel Ledoux, whose works opened up the fascinating world of inequalities to me. In addition to the joint influence of these four teachers, I incorporated other elements and created my own mathematical style, which then evolved as it pleased chance to bring me into contact with new friends and new ideas. Three years after my defense with my longtime collaborator Laurent Devillette, I discovered an apparently improbable link between Kant's inequality in elasticity theory and the production of entropy for the Boltzmann. There was also the hidden link between optimal transport and sobriety inequalities, which I had detected earlier with Dario Cordero e Rosca and Bruno Nazare, a connection that astounded many analysts who thought they really understood their inequalities. In 2004, as a visiting research professor in the Miller Institute at Berkeley, I had the good fortune to meet another future co-author, the American mathematician John Lott, then a guest of the MSRI. Together, we showed that insights from the study of optimal transport in economics could be used to tackle various problems in non-smooth non-Euclidean geometry. The theory that came out of our collaboration has had the effect of breaking down a few more barriers between analysis and geometry. Each time a personal encounter set everything in motion. It was as though I had acted as a catalyst. But I also firmly believe in the importance of searching for pre-existing harmonies. After all, Newton, Kepler, and so many others have already shown us the way. Everywhere you look, the world is filled with unsuspected connections. Now here is Gribouille singing, except of her song. Nope. Didn't no one ever suppose they had anything at all in common? Him, the sailor who was in Formosa, and her, who was the Rose of Dublin. Cedric again. Nor did anyone ever imagine for a moment that Landau Damping and Kolmogorov theorem had the slightest thing in common, except for Etienne's. Tricked, perhaps bewitched, bewitched. By some mischievous sprite, Etienne had somehow divined that there was a connection between the two. Almost one year to the day after our conversation back in Lyon last April, I finally figured out what it is. Mm. A loss of regularity in a perturbative context due to resonance phenomena is made up for by Newton's scheme exploiting the completely integrable character of the system that is disturbed. Amazing that this idea ever occurred to me at all. Who would ever have imagined that something so weird could be real? Landau Damping, to begin with. Who would ever have believed that it's fundamentally a question of regularity? Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Cedric. Now, would you please welcome Michael Harris to read from Mathematics Without Apologies. Well, it's not so easy to say in a few words what my book is about or, or why I wrote it. Uh, the first question the publisher asked was, what's the book about? And, and, I said, huh. and I said, well, why don't you wait until it's written and then we can both find out at the same time. And uh, they, they didn't like that, so I must have said something like this. It's, uh, so insofar as the present book is about anything, it's about how it feels to live a mathematician's double life, one life within the framework of uh, professional autonomy and intellectual freedom answerable only to our colleagues and the other life in the world at large. I, it's so hard to I'm reading the, wearing the wrong glasses excuse me it's so hard to explain what we do that uh, what we do that when on rare occasions we make the attempt uh, we usually leave the next question unasked why are we doing why are we doing this so uh, in other words um, in other words let me get my equipment in place in, in other words the uh, so the book is if you, in this version it's about what it feels like to be a mathematician and why we do it. Now, um, now uh, the uh, the I'll tell you the answer. The, if in case you don't, the why we do it. The uh, in case this is a spoiler. The, uh, the the reason we do it is that it feels good. Um, it gives us pleasure. It's uh, we find it exciting. It, thrilling and, and uh, a kind of intellectual freedom that we can't find anywhere else. But usually we're not allowed to say that. Um, and that, in some sense, is c connected with the title of the book. The uh, title alludes, it um, means a number of things, but one of the things is it's an allusion to uh, G.H. Hardy's The Mathematician's Apology. Now, uh, this is book uh, David is the book David Foster Wallace called The Most Lucid English Prose Work Ever on Math. And he's known, uh, among other things, he says a lot of things, that for uh, saying, insisting in this book that, as a number theorist, and I'm also a number theorist, he had never done anything useful. Now, this, these days, uh, is in our present condition of, uh, of, of austerity is, is considered a quaint anachronism. And in fact, you get, uh, you get this. Here's a, here's a quotation from from Forbes in the book, the irony of Hardy's life, as if there, was, there were one irony, is that his useless work in obscure number theory and random numbers has found application in cryptography and encryption. And in case you're wondering what's so special about that, uh, Simon Singh explains that when you enter your credit details on the internet, they are encrypted using pure mathematics, meaning number theory, so that only the dealer can decrypt your message and complete the transaction. The entire boom in e-commerce, which at the time of writing was worth a trillion dollars, would not have been possible without pure mathematics. So number theory is not merely useful. It's, in fact, the bedrock of modern shopping. Now, uh, as for, as for e-commerce, uh, here's a quotation from... Uh, so this is supposed to be good news, but here's, here's something that, that uh, Tom Waits said about, uh, about e-commerce. Uh, bookstore owners and record store owners used to be oracles. You'd go in this dusty old place, like, like, like this one, and they might point you towards something that would change your life. All that's gone. Well, fortunately, not, not, not completely. But uh, well, I find appalling, as a number theorist, that w when we have to beg for funding, we're supposed to brag about having developed methods that put independent bookstores and record stores out of business. So as, uh, so as a number theorist, I hope you will help me assuage my conscience. And uh, when you go home, you print out if your, your, your Amazon wish lists. I know many of you have them. And then first thing in the morning, run back here and buy everything on them from a real store, from real people working real jobs with real wages. And then, and then I will feel much better. So, so uh, the, you, you may have gathered that that the book was intended in part as an expression of social responsibility. I, uh, when I was writing it, the, uh, the uh, crash of 2008 was still fresh in everybody's mind. In fact, it's still fresh in most people's mind. Uh, if I'd written it a few years later, I might, after the, 
the Snowden revelations, I might have talked about about uh, surveillance, which is also, uh, which number theory is also very useful. But here, here's a here's an excerpt from the chapter about financial mathematics. So, you're in for it now, is what the time traveler told himself when he descended into the underground world of H.G. Wells's time machine. And that's what I told myself in 2000 at the European Congress of Mathematicians in Barcelona when a speaker at a roundtable on the future of mathematics hailed the recent explosion of finance mathematics that providentially brought so many undergraduate and master students to our department's lonely corridors. A visit to Colombia in 2004 revealed the full scope of the phenomenon. A colleague boasted that Colombia's mathematical finance program was underwriting the lavish daily spreads of fresh fruit, cheese, and chocolate brownies when other departments, including mine in Paris, were lucky to offer a few tea bags and a handful of cookies to calorie-starved graduate students. I spent a month living on my own, and when I walked down the stairs after staying late at the office, even at 9 or 10 p.m., I could hear traders sent up by their Wall Street offices struggling with their late-night equations. It brought to mind Morlocks, the underground workers Wells' time traveler encountered at the bottom of his descent, toiling in the darkened basement of applied stochastic analysis to provide fresh fruit for the daily teas of the sunny Eloy of pure mathematics. When I returned for a longer visit four years later, the city's economy had rebounded and traders were still over staying overtime for basement classes. Then, in one of those ironic reversals that are much more entertaining when they take place in a novel set 800,000 years in the future than when they unfold in real time with us in the middle, the Morlock traders turned out to be too big to fail, which entailed not literally eating all the rest of us, but setting us to working for the foreseeable future to bail them out. So, uh, so I wanted to write about what it's really like to be a mathematician and what uh, I wanted to express some social responsibility, but I also wanted to make this uh, a book, uh, a personal book. I wanted to show that it was connected to the culture, but to some of the aspects of the culture that are particularly important to me and what that meant. Uh, and this I'd been thinking about for a number of years before I, I started writing, was that there should be, in the middle of the book, there should be chapters on sex, but the relation mathematics to sex, drugs, and rock and roll in, in that order. And, and in fact, I knew pretty early on what I wanted to say about uh, drugs. I mean, it's, very, it's a very, very loose relation. And, and rock and roll, but I couldn't find a, a plausible, uh, plausible lead for sex until my colleague, Ed Frankel, a professor at Berkeley, made an erotic film starring himself, <laughs> a 30-minute erotic film, in, in which he, is, he plays a mathematician who performs harakiri after having tattooed a very, very complicated formula on his lover's belly. I won't try to, to, to explain <laughs> this, but, but this, when, I, when I saw this, this I, I, I knew I had a chapter on, on love. His, his, the film is called Rights of Love and Math, and I knew I had a chapter on love, math, and cinema. So here, here's, here's an excerpt from the chapter. Relatively few professions are practiced even intermittently in the nude. And while rights of love and math is likely to reopen the long overdue debate on whether mathematics should be one of them, I find the film most explosively scandalous in its confusion of genres, practically a category mistake, focused on the reconciliation mentioned in the film's press packet of spirit and flesh, more classically known as the mind-body problem. Archimedes deserved a Best Supporting Role nomination for dramatizing the problem in Plutarch's Life of Marcellus. And here's Plutarch talking about Archimedes. He neglected to eat and drink and took no care of his person. He was often carried by force to the baths, and when there he would trace geometrical figures in the ashes of the fire, and with his finger draws lines upon his body when it was anointed with oil, being in a state of great ecstasy and divinely possessed by his science. The Archimedes of classical literature embodies a metaphysical paradox. On the one hand, in the Plutarch quotation, as well as in his Eureka scene, the most persuasive argument to date in favor of mathematical nudity, he created this classic figure of the mathematician distracted to the point of total withdrawal from the material world, reduced to mind alone. On the other hand, 
In the familiar anecdotes just recalled, Archimedes' body is literally visible and uncovered. In a third anecdote, also from Plutarch, which you probably know, a Roman soldier's sword severed the spirit from the flesh of the Greek mathematician found in a transport of study, of study and contemplation on the beach near Syracuse. Seen from the outside, the mathematician's body is an object of ridicule, inappropriately displayed and in the way. But from the inside, the body is irrelevant, at best serving as a convenient surface for the drawing of geometric diagrams, as the lover's body in Frankel's film is, in the end, only a surface for preserving Frankel's magic formula, or as in the bodies of in uh, Catherine Millet's narrative, the sexual life of Catherine Millet, don't ask me what that's doing here, not least her own, are little more than machines performing repetitive and largely predictable motions in a variety of natural and artificial settings. The scandal of Archimedes and of Western metaphysics as a whole is that the mind forever ceases its inventions and, and discoveries when the body is left in a heap on the sand. Attempts to transcend our material limitations and to encompass the infinite within our finite bodies lead invariably to swift retribution and martyrdom, expulsion from the Garden of Eden, the fall of Icarus, crucifixion, or the insanity of the mathematicians represented in popular films. The hero of Darren Aronofsky's pie, having computed the 216-digit number from which all patterns in nature arise, escapes martyrdom only by voluntarily ridding himself with the help of a power drill of the substance responsible for his mathematical understanding, located on the border between spirit and flesh in his right temporal lobe. So finally, because it's a book about mathematics, there should be mathematics in it, and so uh, there... So there's a series of chapters scattered th throughout the book called How to Explain Number Theory at a Dinner Party. And there's a story that goes with this. Um, uh, I'll tell you the story, then I'll, then I'll explain what, what happened after that. So during the spring of 2008, I was invited by the – there I am in Columbia again – to deliver the Samuel Eilenberg Lectures. The appointment involved living away from my family for several months. Working late in the department one Friday evening – I must have looked even more forlorn than usual because a colleague passing my open door decided on the spot to invite me home to dinner. Several other mathematicians had been invited, along with a neighbor from another department and the neighbor's visiting friend, a young British woman who turned out to be an actress between jobs, a real professional actress with an agent and a long string of film and TV credits as well as a steady and successful career on the stage. She talked about the trials of being a performer, hinting that not all her peers suffered quite so much as she did. The younger men and women among the mathematicians alluded to their own career anxieties, while their tenured colleagues offered reassuring but noncommittal replies. The actress glowed enigmatically during this part of the conversation, but when it came time to serve dessert, she turned to me without warning and asked, What is it you do in number theory anyway? <laughs> The other mathematicians looked at me in unison, <laughs> holding their collective breath. I had stumbled into the awkward moment every mathematician dreads, w with the exception of Cedric Villani, of course. Uh, my, my, my predicament heightened by the questioner's quiet radiance. If you have ever found yourself next to a mathematician at a dinner party, the British mathematician Tim Gowers once wrote, you have probably, out of politeness or perhaps desperation, asked what he or she works on. Variants of this scenario take place in cocktail parties, on long-distance flights, more rarely at singles bars. If you do not have a mathematics degree, Gowers continued, you will almost certainly have received a disappointing answer such as, I work in Iwasawa theory, which sometimes I actually work in Iwasawa theory, <laughs> but it would take too long to explain to you what that is. All of us in the room were in our own ways performing artists, of course, but the mathematicians were trapped in the invariable role of emissaries from a distant and reputedly inhospitable planet. So what happened was I uh, came up with something on the spot. For 10 minutes, we talked about what number theorists do, and, and, uh, and that was fine. I moved on to something else. But I realized that this might happen again, and so I decided to write about half a, do a dozen pages to prepare for, for such eventualities, and, and those expanded and, and followed by fictional, fictional uh, dialogues between a fictional number theorist and a no less fictional 
performing artists that are uh, scattered th throughout the book, and that's the mathematical content. So uh, there's also some serious material, like the last chapter, which was just translated into French, uh, but in the Quinzen Littéraire, but uh, I, think I'll, I think I'll stop there. Okay, um, I'm going to begin with. Is this on? Can yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to begin with a couple of questions, and then I'm conscious there'll be uh, quite a few probably from the audience, so I'll open it out quickly. Um, I guess the first thing I want to, the first thing that struck me when reading both of your books actually was the the repeated reference to the arts and philosophy. Um, so Cedric, in yours, we have songs. We have reference to literature in Neil Gaiman. Michael, in yours, we have. Uh, lots of references to Alistair MacIntyre. We have uh, the, the chapter on Thomas Pynchon. Um, I was just wondering if both of you could talk a little bit about what you see as the relationship between mathematics and the arts. I mean, are these these are things that often we see as sort of separate disciplines. But uh, on the subject of inspiration and imagination, something I got from both of the books was that maybe these these disciplines are closer than we than we think. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> it's closer. First, we think of our field as some uh, kind of art. Imagination plays a huge role, especially when we are talking about objects which don't have material existence. We have to imagine what we want to prove, what are their properties, and so on. Even we can invent these objects. Which is the right object? A lot of imagination, so many possibilities. Second, as in any field which has a lot of possibilities, aesthetic develops to guide you. You know, so many things you would be tempted to prove, but you will try to prove the thing that looks to you most beautiful. You will be so proud when you have achieved this, it will be enlightening and so on. And so the mathematicians spend part of their life discussing about how beautiful or how ugly this thing is. And uh, then, uh, mathematics is a very constrained discipline as reaction always when you have constraint creativity comes in it's natural, they come hand in hand I often say uh, in the same way as poetry is usually the more constrained the most constrained of the arts about writing and the one in which imagination is most praised the same way mathematics is the most constrained logical discipline and the one in which imagination plays the strongest role. Well, I have been... It's a source of irritation for me. has been, been uh, for many, many years, has been, been uh, Hardy's insistence that mathematics is to be understood as arts if it, or to, to be valued as arts if it's to be valued at all. Because uh, it seems to me that this is just taken at face value, and and uh, the connection. And specifically, he talks about the, the arts and beauty almost uh, as synonymous. Where and he was writing this at a time when art was dissociating itself from beauty, and and so so there's some 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 sort of of, of contradiction in that. And I and I actually tried to understand the roots of, of his ideas about that, and I draw that out in, in one of the chapters. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, so my, my, my hypothesis is that when mathematicians talk about beauty, it's a, a polite way of talking about pleasure because you, it's, if, you, if you say that it's an art, then you, it sounds like something, something, something elevated, whereas if you just say it, uh, it makes you feel good, that's, that's somehow not the sort of thing that you're, you're supposed to say in polite company. Uh, but on the other hand, the, there's no question that that uh, mathematics and art are both creative activities, and there's a, there's a history to to recognizing that. I, I try to draw that out as, as well. But as far as the references to literature, I, I found that in order to talk about mathematics, I had to draw on, on literary techniques and, and, and comparisons because I wanted to talk about it in a way that could be understood by people who don't necessarily know what mathematics is. Mm -hmm. It was a way, perhaps, to, to make it accessible to mm -hmm. drawing on things that mm -hmm. people in their life. Mm -hmm. Yes, one should also say uh, it's 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 uh, perfectly true what you say about there's distinction uh, out there between art and beauty. But when we 
talk between ourselves mathematicians we often uh, use the beauty but uh, beauty uh, preferably but always beauty when we talk about it comes with the feeling of surprise if there is no element of surprise we will not call it a beautiful argument or beautiful proof it has to be some novelty and in this sense it's a bit closer to what uh, artists will uh, always uh, strive for Uh, recently, I was reading text by Henri Poincaré saying something that also one has to... It's more general with connection to the human activities and uh, humanities and saying that research, before being about logic, is like an adventure because you are exploring the unknown and there are this kind of breadth It's a saga, it's a novel, whatever. And he was saying there are some uh, novels which for a mathematician will be worth 100 books of geometry, meaning just the breadth of adventure is also so important to be a scientist. It's, it's, it's an interesting um, point. I mean, because uh, one thing actually that struck me again in, in both of the books... Um, was this, this sense of uh, collaboration. Because obviously, as you spoke about earlier, Cedric, this, uh, often when we hear about someone solving or proving a theorem, it's often one person held up as almost the, the hero of this saga. And one thing that struck me was how, yeah, how collaborative um, uh, mathematics seems to be as a, as a discipline. I mean, is, the, is this idea of the sort of the, the lone mathematician locked in his garret solving a problem over 15 years of hard work is it sort of is that a romanticized idea of the mathematician or is that is that something which still which still exists and is still kind of essential to 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 solving to to tr finding these proofs it certainly works better in a screenplay <laughs> and <laughs> and ev even though though uh, ed frankel wanted to break with one of his objectives and putting himself on display like that was was uh to break with the 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 uh stere stereotypes of of uh mathematicians that are projected in in, in popular films including Daronofsky and they're all pretty much so, uh loners and um uh, but he also was a loner in, in in his in his film the uh the fact is that you're collaborating constantly you're not only collaborating with people around you, but you're also collaborating with the past and your part. And it would, in fact, the mathematics th does not make any sense except as, as social activity. The, the, uh, it's a, it's a, a, one of the, uh, the longest, as, 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 my, as, one, as one of my, one of my, as my thesis advisor wrote, it's the, the longest ongoing conversation of humanity in some sense. It's, uh, uh, let me, uh, this is uh, totally true. This stereotype of lone mathematician is extremely persistent. Uh, it is one of the most serious problems, for instance, in the recent uh, movie about Turing, you know, imitation game. I know how people liked it, but I thought it was a terrible movie because I knew the story already. I have read the biography of Turing in great detail and also I saw it makes no sense from research point of view. You see, you see Turing working all alone on his machine. In reality, Turing was using a lot of uh, mathematics from the past indeed. He was using, the movie doesn't mention this, he was using the collaboration of the Polish mathematicians before him to start the ground. And he was using a lot of ideas obtained in conversation with others. He was the leader, no doubt about this. And without him, it would not have been made. But the leader is not the guy alone. Imagine the team uh, in the football team, the guy that be alone trying to score the goals and so on. Makes no sense, gosh. So he was the leader, but the movie describes him as a, as a loner. This is a big mistake, and we all know how much we uh, depend on the environment. And it's true. It's the people from the past whose ideas we're exploiting. It's our colleagues in laboratory. It's a few collaborators with whom we've, we write the papers. Sometimes the people to which we expose the results, and that will help you improve it, and so on. So it's incorporated into the community. And, that, and that's, again, something which, which comes out very much in, in both books. Um, I mean, Michael, you talked earlier about uh, social responsibility of the mathematician. Uh, and uh, likewise, as Cedric, we find in your book um, 
uh, that you take over. You sort of there's a you agonise over over whether to to take over the the, the management of the uh, Institute uh, Henri Poincaré, and and it's something that that interests me. It's sort of this. So we we had this sense of like the the writer is therefore not the, the mathematician is not therefore this sort of this lone figure in their garret. But beyond that, do you think there is a social responsibility of the mathematician, whether in the sort of the the use uh, your your theories and proofs are put to, or just sort of more generally um, in your in your involvement with society at large. This is uh, yes, go on. <laughs> well, well, okay. I've uh, the the there's there's physicists physicists after the uh, the atomic bomb exploded decided a number of physicists decided it was time for them to. Uh, to, to take responsibility for the consequences of their work. And there, have, there are institutions that have existed for, for a number of years and since, since that time in particular are still more or less effective. There has been no such uh, movement among mathematicians, but I think it's overdue, especially after the Snowden revelations. Uh, there was a, a, a discussion, there was an open discussion of the, uh, of the uh, role of mathematics with the NSA in the United States, even uh, earlier, with GCHQ in, in England. And now France will, after this recent law has passed, now France will have the pleasure of, 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 of uh, the French mathematicians will have the, the pleasure of, of interrogating themselves on their, their relations with the, the DGS. So, so I think it's important. I think it's about time. I don't know how, how that's going to happen, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. And the, also the, the financial mathematics. But there are a number of issues. I'm sure that's going to happen soon. Yes, financial mathematics is one in which responsibility of mathematicians was uh, pointed out by many people. And uh, which uh, mathematician responded to saying it was an unfair uh, trial. All they had done was producing the mathematics. And then it had been used in an incorrect way. This was, uh, to quite some extent, quite true. But then the debate arises, as Michael rightly points, should we care about the applications of our own work? And it's a debate physicists have had. They have not solved it. It's still an open debate with some people uh, believing, yes, it is their right as physicists to uh, be responsible and to care about the uh, applications, and others saying, we produce a science and society decides what to do about it. And it's the politicians who have to decide what use is made of it. And there are arguments on each side. It's something which is impossible to, you know, to decide as a debate. But mathematicians certainly already are uh, in a position so that they can decide, each of them, I want to be part of the responsibility and the, the guidelines of how to apply this or that theorem that the community proved, or people who prefer to say, oh, I don't want to be uh, in there. Okay, um, I could go on for quite a while, but I'm going to open it up because I know we, we have limited time. So would anybody like to ask a question? Just raise your hand and I'll pass the, the microphone. Thank you. Uh, this is... To you, Mr. Villani, um, I don't know if you're being facetious, but one thing that you said that surprised me, uh, being the rational person that you obviously are, that you, you said that you believe in miracles. Could you explain that, please? Well, what makes you think that I am a rational person? <laughs> <laughs> Mathematician. You know, it is known... I. I uh, I worked on the biography of uh, Turing because I wrote a book, actually a graphic novel, which is uh, which was out recently, in which he's one of the heroes. And for instance, I noticed uh, Turing was put in a state of uh, terror by consulting with uh, how you call this uh, in voyant uh, fortune teller. A fortune teller, uh, not uh, far before, not long before his death. And there are many stories like this. Mathematicians are rational when it comes to write a mathematical theorem. But they can be superstitious. 
they can be irrational, they have things they love and things they don't love. There are, I heard once and I found it reasonable after all that uh, there are more, that mathematicians are more frequently believers, I mean religious people, than biologists, for instance. And uh, it uh, makes sense to me. Don't think that uh, uh, a mathematician is necessarily rational. He produces rationality, but he himself is a human being. It is well known that Newton was mystic, looking for crazy messages in the universe, doing uh, uh, alchemy. You read Kepler, it's just the same. And it's there uh, quite often. Now, when I say I believe in miracles... I will not say it's real belief or miracle. I'm not sure what I mean by that actually, but I do. I do mean it. it. Means when I am looking, searching for a theorem, I systematically try and search for some thing unexpected and rather miraculous. Strategies worked in the sense that I discovered a number of cases something which was unexpected by me or by others and was looking like a bit of a miracle now you can say it's just intuition and uh, feeling that something was sufficiently rich that some coincidence can happen in there some people will say it's uh, it's more than that who knows uh, it's also related to the belief about the nature of mathematics and I say it's a belief really there is this long going debate going for so, so many years, whether mathematics is something existing independently of the human construction, or whether it is just a human invention. And like many people nowadays, I belong to the category of people who believe that it's independent of uh, mathematics, and there is some kind of world of concepts out there our world in which mathematics exists and matter is something like the flesh put on the mathematical bones. It looks like fantasy. It's uh, so many people and people in the old days would say, Are you crazy, what is it about? Uh, but it's a belief I would uh, quite share. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it would be anyway very, how to say, pretentious to say that we understand really what the world is. So let's continue to behave kind of irrationally as private individuals as long as we take rational, uh, rational, how to say, habits in communicating or discussing. I, I want to add just, I have a sentence in here. This is in, in the discussion of philosophy of mathematics and, and um, uh, I... It's a response to a philosopher of mathematics. It says, we should get out of the habit of assuming that mathematics is about being rational, at least as this is understood by philosophers of mathematics. There's a, 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 long, a, a long tradition of founding reason on, on mathematics. And what, to what, what, I'm not going to take a position on whether that's a sensible thing to do, but certainly it has very little to do with the practice of mathematicians. But uh, it's, that's not what ma mathematics. It's it's. And there's, there's, there are a lot of misconceptions about this. Uh, there's a uh, very lively debate going on in my blog at this very moment on on, on this very topic, uh, whether mathematicians should aim at something called truth or whether there's some other some other goal, other values. And I would certainly say it's the latter. Okay. Do we have? It's, uh, it seems to me that in history, um, a lot of uh, theorems that were uh, discovered or developed and proven found uh, very significant applications in, in different industries. Um, do you think conceptually that uh, this is the case, that every theorem we have, either currently or in the future, will, find, uh, will be found to have uh, some uh, practical application? If this is the case, is math conceptually um, simply uh, a way to describe uh, natural phenomena? I think only small minority of theorems have applications. And I think, uh, more precisely, a 
tiny portion of theorems have applications, a small but bigger portion of theorems inspire applications rather than having them directly. And uh, the majority of theorems is there to improve the global knowledge. And uh, it can have indirect applications. I mean, if it helps you putting your radio crease on this topic, it may help you to find another theorem which will have applications. So many theorems will serve applications in a rather indirect way. Let me take one example um, from theoretical physics, an example which is often good, but also related to mathematics, very famous example, and that I was uh, reading about recently and following some discussion. One of the big scientific revolutions of 20th century was general relativity. Exactly 100 years ago, and the masterpiece of Einstein. I mean, special relativity, restricted relativity, it was in the air. But general relativity, it was a real big thing. A beautiful theory putting for the first time at large scale non-Euclidean geometry in our vision of the universe. It, all of a sudden, with this theory, a bunch of mathematical notions found application in physics. So-called Ricci curvature in particular, but a lot of formalism and works from differential geometry became incorporated in this physics vision. And so it was revolution. What are the applications? Usually people will say, people who have seen it a bit will say, not many applications, only one. And that is, people in the audience know f probably, who knows about the one application of general relativity as usually is told, GPS. Thank you, Jean-Michel. So, uh, uh, GPS is because when you have GPS, uh, when you are, uh, uh, it's uh, all about uh, the various times which the satellites, when you have the satellite emitting, uh, looking at the signal, how much is the proper time of this, of this uh, satellite and so on, you need to know proper, proper time corresponding to the signal when you want to reconstruct from these various times, from various positions, which is the position that you are at. Without the, the, the GPS, without the uh, taking into account general relativity, it would uh, be a huge mess. It would, you would never have the, the precision that you need. It would, after a day, I think, you would fail by one kilometer or something like this. However, so this already is something, you see, one of the biggest theories of mankind, only one technological application, however a big one. When you go further in the details, you will see that people in the engineering of GPS, they do not really use the general relativity. They know that they have to take this into account because it distorts things, but they also have other things to take into account as sources of distortion. Maybe there are things with the, how the air is here and there. So certain effects who are not, which are not negligible either. And then they search for the error. Say, here is this polynomial that we are going to fit to appreciate the error, which will cover at the same time the general relativity errors and all the rest. I cannot tell you uh, exactly what they are, but it was there in the discussion I was uh, reading. And so uh, you will see that in the end they don't use any theorem from the general relativity. But knowing that it is there helps them uh, understanding and uh, putting together, putting the theoretical device that will make it possible. It's often like this. So I have absolutely no disagreement with anything that Cedric said. Cedric, of course, works in, a, in an area of mathematics whose origins uh, are in, in, uh, in applications and in study of physics in particular, whereas number theory, for the most part, uh, was innocent of applications until until relatively recently. Um, now, Archimedes, when he's not running around uh, naked or drawing on his on his body, uh, in, in the same Plutarch was uh, Plutarch has him say that he did 
this had he although he was inventing war engines and so on all he really cared about was the purest mathematics that had no no applications whatsoever and that that's a a uh, a theme that goes back at least to Plutarch also 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 to Plato uh that mathematics the goal of mathematics is not the 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 uh the the most uh the the most valuable the most uh uh, uh the, the 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 areas of mathematics that are most worthy of respect are the pure areas that have no application whatsoever now uh i of course there's, there's there are no such uh clear distinctions what i am what does bother me uh, about this question not only that is is not only that that uh well the, we have to uh pretend to be working for the sake of applications when we apply for our grants but but that the question the question is in whose interest are these applications? Is it are are we to be proud that uh, number theorists have are putting all these independent bookstores out of business? It's uh, it's uh, the the what, one can't really separate uh, applications from existing power relations, and I think that's uh, and, and that that uh, that's a theme I try to develop in the book. Uh, I remember I was having a discussion recently with a colleague, saying uh, Cedric. Try and figure out. I tell you that in history, the first field of application of mathematics has always been war and military. And I tried to prove him wrong, and I did not manage really. It seemed to me that, yes, he seemed to be right. You know, when technology is out there, people always try to use it for all kinds of ways. Ways which uh, are good and ways which are bad, ways which they think are good and that we think are bad, or sometimes the reverse. And uh, technology is powerful, and technology can be used in, in any way. Also, um, it's important to recall, and as Michael, it just was um, apparent in Michael's answer also, uh, I, I maintain what I said, only a tiny proportion of theorems have applications, but often you don't know which ones cannot tell in advance. Some areas, you know that there will be more applications than others, but you can never tell for sure. Okay, on that note, I'm afraid we're going to have to finish there. Um, just a couple of things to say. Firstly, uh, both of the books are available at the counter. Um, Cedric and Michael will be sticking around f to, to sign them for you, but please make sure you do buy the books before you come up to get them signed. Um, I can't recommend both books enough. I mean, I read them in parallel and they're very different books, but very complementary. Um, so if, you, uh, you know, if you've got the, the, the time, the money and the inclination, if you could take both of them, I really, I really would thoroughly recommend it. Uh, otherwise, uh, stick around. We're going to be serving some wine, uh, chatting, book signing, you know, the usual. Um, so it just remains for me to uh, thank Cedric and Michael for coming here tonight. Uh, thank you, guys. I uh, hope to see you again soon.